The last waters receded from far western Oklahoma during the Triassic and Jurassic periods in what's known as the Mesozoic era of geologic history. It was in this time that dinosaurs flourished, and both footprints and fossils near Black Mesa State Park indicate that indeed Oklahoma did harbor these ancient giants. This quarry near Black Mesa yielded many large herbivore bones from the Morrison Formation, a famous dinosaur bone yielding deposit. Scientists study rocks and fossils to learn more about the environments that were present here in Oklahoma many millions of years ago. We get a lot of marine reptiles and fossil fish that, that come out of the rocks here, as well as a few invertebrates, ammonites, and things like this. This is certainly one of our more spectacular uh, examples of a marine reptile. This is a mosasaur. We're lucky if we find a full skeleton because those are extraordinarily rare. When we find most of the skeleton, quite often it's not fully articulated, uh, meaning everything's in its proper place. Because an animal dies and there's a variety of things that can happen. For one, that's a bunch of meat laying around that another animal might want to eat. And so during the process of scavenging, bones get knocked apart. If the animal dies on the land surface, the wind and, and just traffic, animals kicking bones apart. This is sort of like CSI, but dealing with really, really cold cases. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out what happened to the victims. The fact that we can say anything all, at all is pretty good, but there are always going to be unanswered questions. O Oklahoma's probably more known for uh, its fossils, fossil collecting, than, uh, than, than most other states in the country. So, so a huge range of kinds of fossils we find here in Oklahoma. Petrified wood, dinosaur fossils, marine, marine invertebrates. Just about every kind of fossil you can name are found here in Oklahoma. Oklahoma was relatively quiet for the next 100 million years until the Cretaceous period. During this time, Oklahoma stayed well high and dry. But soon, the Cretaceous Interior Seaway moved into southeastern Oklahoma and the modern-day Red River Valley. Dinosaurs roam these coastlines, and Oklahoma's official dinosaur, Acrocanthosaurus atokinesis, was first discovered near Broken Bow, Oklahoma. A replica of this T-Rex-like meat-eater can be seen today at the Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History in Norman, Oklahoma. Also, giant marine creatures such as mesosaurs and ammonites roam the shallow seas throughout the region and can now be found in deposits in southern Oklahoma. Now, this, guys like this would have been around um, during the age of dinosaurs. Uh, this is an ammonite. Uh, this is actually from the Dakotas. It's not from Oklahoma. But you can find um, quite large ammonites like this along the Red River. Fossil hunters and rockhounds flocked to the shores of Lake Texoma to collect the abundant specimens. And we found some, I mean, there's some other ones over here. Oh, that looks pretty good. And I haven't found any, any whole ones yet. Okay. But uh, pieces like this. And the, one of the nice things is that, you know, the group that came yesterday, oh, that's kind of nice. Oh, yeah, that's good. You see the sutures? Yeah. The group that came yesterday, you can also go through their leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> Digging for ammonites. Tell us a little bit about where we are and why we're here. We're in the Cretaceous. We're in the Upper Cretaceous. We're in 600 feet of water, and ammonites were living here. We can tell that ammonites were living here because we find all these remnants. The Cretaceous age of the dinosaurs was surely a fascinating period of Earth history. 
But here in Oklahoma, only in the far southern and eastern portions of the state, and in small pockets in western Oklahoma, can Cretaceous rocks be found. About 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, and the beginning of the Tertiary period, dinosaurs disappear from the rock record. The Mesozoic era had ended, and a new era of geologic time, the Cenozoic era, had begun. Following the Cretaceous, ocean water would never again touch Oklahoma soil, but this high and dry land was fertile ground for the diversification of both plant and animal species. The story in Oklahoma since the last seawaters fell has been one of landscape modification through erosion, weathering, and transport of materials down rivers. In fact, much of ancient Oklahoma now lies deep in the Gulf of Mexico, or buried in the Gulf Coastal Plain in deltaic deposits formed by the Mississippi River. In the dry and arid Oklahoma panhandle lies Black Mesa, the highest point in the state. Black Mesa formed from lava flows pouring out of volcanoes in nearby New Mexico and Colorado. The thick black basalts flowed out of the volcanic eruptions about a million years ago. The volcanoes at Black Mesa are of a different type than the explosive kind that you find in places like Oregon or Washington. Those volcanoes are very quiet, smooth flowing lavas with not a lot of gas associated with them. As, as a result, they are not explosive like some of the other volcanoes that you hear about. Oklahoma did have volcanoes, however, of that type. During the Cambrian, in the Oklahoma Rift, we have granites and rhyolites. And rhyolites are eruptive volcanic rocks that occur at the surface. That type of volcano is generally associated with the types of rocks that contain a lot of gas. So what happens if I bring some magma from deep within the earth up to close to the surface during a volcanic eruption? The pressure decreases on that volcano until I get to the top and I get an eruption. The reason I get an eruption in volcanoes such as these is because there is a lot of gas contained within the magma and when I take the top off the pressure is released quickly and an eruption occurs. As the Rocky Mountains were uplifted to their full height to the west, a large area of sand and gravel slowly shed eastward into western Oklahoma. This formed the High Plains and the very important Ogallala Aquifer. The significance of the of the Ogallala formation is that it is a it is a significant aquifer uh, it has uh, holds a tremendous amount of water and has given much of the panhandle of Oklahoma uh, water for irrigation purposes this lonesome mountain range in far western Oklahoma is known as the Antelope Hills and is a remnant of this vast sheet of sand and gravel deposited on Mesozoic and Permian-aged rock formations. Other aquifers are scattered throughout the state. The Arbuckle-Simpson Aquifer is an important source of water in south-central Oklahoma. Here, at Chickasaw National Recreation Area, an artesian well flows water out of this prolific unit. The water is charged with gypsum and sulfur, giving the water a hard taste and a rotten egg smell. Mineral springs such as these can be found around sulfur and have been believed to have medicinal qualities. Fluid flow in the tertiary is also evident in past and present in several other Oklahoma state parks. Both hot and cold water springs, such as those at Roman Nose and Boiling Springs State Parks, appear, live, and die throughout time. The springs are not hot springs like a lot of people believe. It's actually a cold spring but it's an encased spring that actually bubbles um, from the pressure of the water coming up through the sand. This spongy limestone's full of water, and as the water flows through the formation and out the side of the hill, it comes up through the sand that was deposited by the Canadian River. That forces hydraulically the sediment to bubble up at the top, causing the bubbling or boiling springs. So even though the boiling springs aren't hot, and they're not really boiling, they do have a boiling appearance. We have a couple of, of uh, big springs that are nice to see. Uh, the kind of roaring springs, a lot of people are interested in them. 
Springs like this one form whenever our more resistant unit forces the water to pool up and then run out of the side of a hill. Throughout history, springs like the ones here at Romanoe State Park and like the ones at Boiling Springs State Park have been oases in this rather arid area. Wildlife and human activity often centered around such places. Springs such as these played an important role in the lives of early man that lived among the hills and plains of western Oklahoma. The earliest Oklahoma inhabitants are believed to have come from the northwest and arrived sometime prior to 12,000 years ago. And water sources provided access to food in the form of wild game, such as the bison. Native Oklahomans also used the land as a tool for hunting game. At this location near modern-day Elk City, Oklahoma, Paleo-Indian peoples would use canyons to hunt their primary source of food and material, the American bison. Today, archaeologists study tools and animal remains left behind to get a better understanding of these ancient Native American cultures. This one particular site is mainly a kill site, and it's a very small remnant of what used to be here. This little bone remnant right in through here is kind of the edge of a of the kill deposits, as you move up slope, you hit into the sandstone bedrock that then projects on up to within a couple of feet of the surface. So it defines the sloping wall of, the, of this gully. And then just back below us, everything levels out and would continue at this level all the way across the canyon for at least 30 feet. By driving herds of bison off canyon ledges, supplies were collected for tribes in a central location, near to the waters and streams of eastern Oklahoma and the supplies of arrow and spear making chert in the Texas Panhandle. And this is a good representation of what these points look like. This is one that's come from this site. In typical fashion, it's made out of a quartzite called Ogallala Quartzite. It's a very tough material to work, but these guys had it down to where they can make pretty decent projectile points. Tribes in eastern Oklahoma also made good use of their geologic resources. The mounds at Spyro are relics of an ancient civilization that was once part of a Mississippian culture of peoples that inhabited the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, such as here at Cahokia Mounds, near St. Louis, Missouri. Here visitors can see burial mounds built as a part of an intricate class system. Tribes in eastern Oklahoma took advantage of the plentiful rivers for trade and navigation using dugout canoes such as this one. Another byproduct of the erosion and dissolution of rocks in recent history can be seen in the development and redevelopment of cavern systems. At Roberts Cave State Park near Wilburton, Oklahoma, Erosion has created a cave in tightly packed sandstone formations. Legend has it that notable outlaws Jesse James and his gang stayed in the cave to try and avoid local law. A different side of Oklahoma history and geology is presented at Hevener Runestone State Park. Here, a tall stone found in a ravine on the northern flank of the Wachita Mountains in the Arcoma Basin preserves a set of engraved runic text purportedly carved by Viking explorers around 1000 AD. However, scholars are at odds both as to the meaning of the runes and to the legitimacy of the origin of the text. Geology played a role in the rune stone in two ways. First of all, the sandstone that the inscription is written upon is Pennsylvanian in age and was formed as the rocks were eroded to the east and deposited in the Arkoma Basin. But more importantly, the fact that this rock is sitting vertically shows us that this rock was eroded at some point a few hundred or thousand years ago making a nice flat billboard for our rock carving friends to come along and doodle on. Erosion is responsible for many of the unique features of this area and continues to affect the area even to this day. Maybe a stone like this, after a few million years of erosion, will become the next rune stone for some future visitor to this place. Across the valley from the rune stone, near the town of Poto, is another Oklahoma geologic oddity. The imposing rock formation west of town is known as Cavanaugh Hill and has been previously claimed by officials as the world's tallest hill without being a mountain. 
One of Oklahoma's top modern day geology attractions is Turner Falls in the Arbuckle Mountains. Turner Falls is a relative newcomer, geologically speaking, to Oklahoma. Thick deposits of a rock called tufa were deposited by Honey Creek. As water dissolved the calcite in the ancient limestones of the Arbuckle Mountains, the water becomes saturated with calcite, or calcium carbonate. As the water flows over the falls, calcium carbonate is then precipitated out of the water, forming the smooth-sided rock formations. The falls are actually growing outward into the valley, rather than eroding back into the hill the way that most other waterfalls do. Many people think of the Oklahoma landscape as solid and unmoving, but the reality is that it moves often, and those movements show up as Oklahoma earthquakes. Uh, earthquake is uh, uh, caused by uh, accumulated stored up strain energy uh, along uh, zones of weakness in the Earth's crust, commonly called faults, and when these when the strain exceeds the, the rock strength, uh, uh, sudden uh, movements occur and the earth shakes, producing earthquakes. On the north side of the Wichita's, very near the Mears Fault, we find the world famous Mears Store. The store is a great place to get oriented about Oklahoma earthquakes, simply by reading the walls as you eat. Well, what's special about the Mears Fault is it's it's a recent fault by definition, and that means it's moved in the last 10,000 years. And there are just very few of these exposures uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. The fault today is not much more than a bump on the horizon. Here, this is, this is it right here. It's a little depression. Now you can see this, that little bump in the landscape comes over right through here heads off in that direction and Highway 58 is about the only place where you could stop. If someone pointed out, basically we're, we're standing right on the fault scar. You can do a lot of things to rocks in nature and some of those things you can do to a cake. One of those things is that you can create a fracture. I will create a fracture by taking my, my knife and I will cut the cake as thusly. Oh, my cake's falling apart. It is broken. I have created displacement along that fracture. And that is something that in geology terms we call a fault. So as you can see, the fault has been created in the cake. And now if I lift this side relative to the other side, I've now displaced the layers. So I've got a yellow layer next to a black layer and a black layer next to a yellow layer. And now the rocks no longer line up as they did when they were first formed. We call that a fault. The other thing that we can do is slide them side by side past each other in this way. So the layers actually stay fairly even with one another, but across the cake here, they're not matching up anymore. This is the same type of fault that you see in places like California, along the San Andreas, where you get major earthquakes when this piece of cake and that piece of cake stick and hold until, boom, they just all of a sudden move. Pretty cool. You get lots of good geology out of a cake like this. And then you can eat it. While the fall may be hard to see with the naked eye, Oklahoma's geophysicists use other means to constantly monitor Oklahoma's earthquake situation. This is a, uh, what we, uh, a seismograph. And it basically, uh, a seismograph station is composed of, of three parts. One is the seismometer or the sensor. And the sensor is located about 1,000 feet uh, west of the building. The, uh, this is the recording unit or the seismograph. And then the information that's recorded on paper is called a seismogram. And this is heat sensitive paper. <clears throat> These little tick marks. The distance between these tick marks is one, one minute. It's an extremely quiet station, so you see very little background noise. And the record has changed uh, once a day. Uh, it's 20, 24 hours to complete the traverse of the pen all the way across the, the paper. And then once a week, uh, Joe Morano, whose store we're in, uh, mails the records to our observatory where they're uh, analyzed and cataloged. 
The seismograph is located in the world-famous Mir Store and Restaurant, which attracts hungry travelers from all over the world. When I first came in this store, the first time I saw it, I came in this store and the, and the owner was carrying a great big pan of freshly ground hamburger meat up to the kitchen. He was complaining to the, his wife, he says, Gladys, you're cooking them faster than I can grind this beef. And I said, my, my, my. If you want to, if you want to sell hamburgers, this is the way to do it. The historic restaurant is known for its huge Mears Burger, made with family-raised Oklahoma Longhorn beef. What brings people in here uh, is, is the beef. No doubt about it, that's what it is. We, got, we have uh, the best hamburger in the state of Oklahoma and probably a lot more places. Uh, this is not vegetarian country. <laughs> Even today, we can witness Oklahoma's landscapes change. At Little Sahara State Park, thousands of years of wind and water continue to pile up river sand into huge dunes that change with every storm. And a few ATVs and motorcycles move around some of that sand too. One way to see the direct effects of these ancient geologic events on Oklahoma's modern economy and society is just to look at the oil and gas industry. Oil and gas is found prolifically in the rock basins scattered throughout the state. Many people's idea of an oil and gas reservoir is a little skewed. A lot of folks think it's just a matter of sticking a straw in the ground and sucking the oil right out. It's a little more complicated than that. Many of the sandstones and shales and siltstones in Oklahoma are oil and gas reservoirs. But they are made out of rock. The petroleum, in this case a little refined motor oil, actually lives within the grains, between the sand. It's actually quite complicated to get out. So as you can see here, when I pour the oil into the sand, it actually starts to slowly filter through the grains. This is because the sand has what we call porosity, which are the pores between the grains, and that's the storage space for the oil. The linkage between the pores is called permeability and is a gauge of how easy or difficult it is to retrieve the oil from the sand. This is a fairly low permeability sand, so you can see the oil actually pools on top of the sand, but it is starting to drain into the reservoir. Now in real life we do this in opposite. The oil is in the reservoir and we have to try and get it out, which is technically a very difficult challenge and can be very expensive. Oklahoma's oil and natural gas industry is substantial, to say the least. Oklahoma has produced billions of barrels of oil and natural gas equivalent throughout the years and continues to be one of the state's largest employers. Seemingly countless numbers of oil and natural gas fields can be found dotting the Oklahoma countryside. And everywhere you look, you can see signs that Oklahoma's economy and culture are heavily influenced by the petroleum industry. Oil and gas is not the only natural resource that Oklahoma derives from its landscapes. Sand, gravel, and stone are mined throughout the state and used for a variety of purposes. Coal is an important source of energy and is mined in eastern Oklahoma. And the soil itself, derived from the rocks, is an important basis for our state's agricultural industry. The geology and landscape have and continue to affect the locations of people, industries, and infrastructure such as locating of highways, dams, and even home schools and businesses. Over one billion years, the events that have formed Oklahoma continue to affect the way Oklahomans live, play, and work every day.